This lecture is very much a continuation of the last one. In the previous one, we looked at uh, the data types, and there's three that we use most commonly. There's the double, which is your basic numeric type. Uh, there's characters and there's logicals. And we actually looked at our very first data structure, which was just a vector that contains these. And this is a vector uh, in, a, in a different sense from the mathematical one. There's no dimensions. It's not a row vector or a column vector. It's just uh, an ordered list or, or set of items. Now we're going to come and start adding more structure onto these and get new types of objects, which are very useful in statistics and data science. So we start with the concept of a, an attribute. So you, you may have noticed that we only have numbers, characters, and logicals. Well, we're missing a lot of useful things that we would need in statistics and, and mathematics. What about a matrix, uh, something that does have dimensions? What about uh, dates? Those aren't the basic types, but those are built on top of the basic types by adding attributes to them. So if you add an attribute to an object, it doesn't change the type. It's still going to stay either logical, integer, double, or so on, but it might change its class. And a class is kind of a higher level classification of object. And we'll see that objects can have specialized behavior depending on their class. If you've done any object-oriented programming, we're starting to hit some of, some of those concepts. And we won't get too deep into that. We'll make use of some um, object-oriented properties. So we'll start by looking at two of the most common attributes, uh, names and then dimensions. So let's start with names. And now we're getting into the code, so I'll switch over to our studio. So I'm gonna start with making just a simple numeric vector like we worked with last time. Uh, and it has three digits corresponding to the three parts of Georgia Southern's main telephone number. So I'll uh, define that object called GSU underscore phone. And I'll see how it prints. So it gives me the first number, 912, then the next, and then the next. I'm going to add some attributes to this object. I'm going to use the names function. And so if the names on GSU phone, I'm going to assign that to, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but those three parts to a phone number, uh, there's names for those. The first part is the area code, and then the exchange, and then the subscriber. It's common to talk about area codes, but exchange and subscriber are a uh, little more obscure. So I'm going to run that. And now let me check what happens if I print that same object now that I've added a names attribute to it. Okay, and this is nice. I still see those same values. And those are the fundamental values that define the core of the object. But then on top of it, it's got the name. And think of that name as something kind of extra or not really part of the core object, but something additional on top of that. Now that I have names assigned to it, I can use the names function to retrieve them if I want to without an assignment. So what are the names on the GSU phone object? The three that we defined, area, exchange, and subscriber. So that's one way to give something names. You can use the names function in conjunction with an assignment and give it names that way. But it's also possible to define the names when the object is created, when the vector is created. So maybe you've heard that song from the 1980s. Well, I won't sing any of it, but it's really catchy. Maybe I'll put a, a YouTube link in the Slack later. Um, here's how to read this. The name for the first entry is area, and the actual value for that first entry is 555. The name of the second entry is exchange, and then the value for that is 867, and so on. So that first part to the left of each of the equal signs, that's not actually what the value is, but it's a, a name for it. And then the value is on the right-hand side. So I'll define that object and let's check that out and see how it prints. Okay, and again, here are the numbers making up the core of the object. And then there's the names for each one of those on top of it. So one thing that's really nice about this, uh, maybe you remember from the previous lecture, there were seven different ways of indexing and, and uh, extracting information out of an, an R object. Now we can see the fourth one. We can use the names of something to refer to it. So first, let's try retrieving. So I'm using square brackets. In the last lecture, we would either put uh, numbers, maybe negative numbers if we want to remove something, or logicals, and it would extract the trues. Now it's going to look for something with that name attribute on it, and it's going to extract that for us. So look at the Gini object, pull out the uh, thing with the exchange name, and there it is. The exchange is 867. If I want to make a vector, a character vector that has multiple names in it, then it will give me back all of the values 
with those corresponding names. So if I want the exchange and the subscriber, there it is, 8675309. And like with any of the ways of retrieving a value, you can use that in conjunction with assignment to replace it. So let's say Jenny has just moved to uh, South Georgia and her area code is changing the 912. This first part is really just accessing the area code. And when the entire line is run, it's replacing it. And so now I can see, yeah, the area code has changed to 912. Okay, and there's a start for the names object or the names attribute. We'll be using that quite a bit today. Any questions at this point? All right, I'll keep on going. Let's now look at the dimension attribute and the kind of objects that can be created from that. So how do you think of a matrix? Do you think of that as a set of numbers with a certain two-dimensional structure? It's not just a loose collection of numbers, but they're uh, aligned into rows and columns. That's how R sees it. If we take a normal R vector, which doesn't have any dimensions, and we add some dimensions to it, well, if we give it two dimensions, it'll become a matrix. If we wanted to, we could give it three, four, however many uh, dimensions, and then it would become a more general array. We won't need to work with arrays in the class, I don't believe, maybe much later. So we'll just work with matrices, the two-dimensional case right now. So I'm gonna start with an ordinary numeric vector, four entries, one, nine, eight, five. Right, and so I see how it prints, just an ordered set of numbers. If I check the type, uh, it's double. And if I check the class, I think this is the first time we've checked the class of something. The class just comes back as numeric, which is a very, very basic kind of class. So now let me add dimensions and I'll show you two ways of doing this. First, I can use the dim function and I can assign some dimensions to it. So let me actually run the first part. If I run that, right now it says null because there are no dimensions. It's just an ordered set. But when I assign the dimensions to be two rows, two columns, well, now let me look at this. Okay, I see the same four values, one, nine, eight, five, but it looks like a matrix. And actually now it is uh, by, by adding dimensions to it. Notice uh, something, by default, it will fill things in uh, by column. So it goes all the way down the first column, filling stuff in, we go to the next column, fill things in and go on like that. So by default, it goes column by column which feels a little weird to me. It feels more natural often to do row by row. So I have to remember that and we'll see how to change it soon. If I check the type, I still have the same kind of data type inside of that, that's still a double. But if I check the class, before it was just numeric, but now it has two classes. It's a matrix because it has two dimensions, but it's also an array, which is a more general kind of objective dimensions. Okay, um, now I'll show you a second way, which I think is a little more direct for creating a matrix. There is a matrix command. If I call the matrix command, I'll tell it, well, first, here's the vector of all the values that I want to go inside the matrix. And then I can tell it how many columns uh, I want and how many rows I want. So I want to make a uh, matrix, two columns, three rows. Let's try running that. Okay, let's take a look at it. And sure enough, now I've got the three rows and it's going down those first, one, nine, eight, goes to the next one, five, one, nine. I could check the dimensions if I want with the dim function. And like I constructed, it's a three by two, read it as three rows, two columns. All right, any questions yet? I'll pause often as we're getting into more complicated stuff now. I have a question. Yeah. Um, look at the matrix, the no matrix. So after you made it to um, two rows and three columns, I have one, nine, eight, five, one, nine. Mm -hmm. What if I, I want um, the one, nine, the nine should be at the second column, you know, something like that. I have one, nine, then eight, five, then one, nine. How would I oh, so you, are you saying if I want to fill it in by row? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's an example of that later, but we can put it here as well. There's an additional argument, which is optional, uh, that you can add to the matrix function. You can set by row equal to true. And so let me try running it this way, and then I'll check the matrix. 
Uh, and now it's going one nine eight five one nine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Now, in mathematics, we nearly always always deal with uh, numeric matrices, but in R, they don't have to be. We could have a logical matrix. Those come up every now and then. We could have a character matrix. Uh, so let's look at this. Let me make a matrix with uh, some characters out of letters instead of instead of numbers. Now in this one, notice I'm telling it how many rows I want, but I'm not telling it how many columns. Uh, if the number of entries in the vector it makes the matrix out of is a multiple of the number of rows, then it'll just stop at the natural place. So let me try this one. And this one's gonna go by row. Okay, yeah, so we had figured out, well, if there's six entries and there's two rows, I'm probably intending for it to have three columns. And yeah, it can figure that out. Now, what if I told it to have two rows and five columns? Now it needs 10 entries, but I've only given it six. So remember the recycling rules. It'll just start back at the beginning and keep going until it reaches the end. All right, so it does that, but it gives me a warning because I didn't end at a clean place. And so it, it's thinking you probably didn't intend that. And it's good to have a warning about it. Okay, uh, just like we can name things in a vector, we could also name the individual entries in a matrix. That's rare and I've never had a need to do that, but it is very common to name uh, the columns or the rows to give names to the dimensions. So let's do that. So first I'm gonna make a uh, matrix called measurements. And let's take a look at what I've created here. Okay, three rows, two columns. This is not just an, a, an, uh, a random set of numbers, but let me give this some meaning by adding some call names, column names, and then I'll add row names as well. And now if I look at this object again, these values are actually uh, the weight and height for uh, me, my, my wife, my daughter. Maybe I'm giving away too much personal information here. It's also kind of inaccurate because since I wrote the notes and summer started, I've put on a few more pounds, but whatever, this will work for now. So uh, this is nice and it might seem like we're getting close to a good general structure for storing data in. And this would work if we only needed numeric data, but we're gonna be doing classification later on in the class, right? Uh, so we need some categories. And because a matrix can only have one type of data, that means we can't mix numbers and, and characters. So we still need to work up towards a more general uh, object for storing data. And we'll, we'll get to that soon. All right, just a little comment. Uh, if you have an array that has more than two dimensions, three or more, there's a dim names for setting those. We shouldn't need to use that, uh, at least for a long time. So now that we've seen uh, the names and the dimensions attribute, you might be wondering what tools there are to work with uh, attributes very generally. And here's a few. If I just call attributes on an object, like the measurements matrix, let's take a look at this. I can see that one of the attributes is a dimension, which is three, two, three rows, two columns. And then there's dim names. And the dim names is actually broken up into two parts. The first part of dim names is, these were the row names. And then the second part of dim names is the, the column names. So that's nice if you want to see what are the attributes on an object? What, what does it have that's in addition to its uh, the basic data, data entries? Another really nice function is STR, that stands for structure. So if I look at this, this kind of gives me an, an entire breakdown of, of this object. So first measurements is something of the numeric type uh, and it's got some dimensions on it. Uh, one rows going from one to three, columns going from one to two. And then here's the actual values that are inside the object. Then what attributes does it have? Well, it's got two attributes. They're both characters because they're names. Uh, and these are the three names for the rows, these are the two names for the columns. So a lot of times if I'm doing something in R that I've never done before, and I'm just wondering what kind of R object is this? What's inside of it? I'll use STR and just see what the structure is. And I'd actually like to add uh, one more to this, another one that I found helpful. So attributes, if you spell out the whole thing, will just give you information about all the attributes. 
If you want to access just one of them more specifically, there's an abbreviated form. Let me see, I hope I can remember how to use this. You tell it what object you're looking at and then give it a string that has the name of the attribute that you wanna see. Okay, yeah, that works. So if I wanna focus in on the dim names attribute of measurements, I can access that this way. All right, other questions at this point? Okay, uh, so now that we have things with dimensions, we have another option for indexing, which is uh, having two, at least two entries uh, in square brackets. So first, let's remember at its core, a matrix is really just a vector that has dimensions. So if I use single brackets and give it just one number, it's gonna give me the, in this case, the third entry in the vector that constitutes the matrix, and it's gonna go column by column. So let me start by having the whole matrix printed out. If I say I want the third entry, it's gonna start here at the top left and it'll go one, two, three. It's gonna spit back 75. So let's check that by running the whole line. Yep, that's where the 75 comes from. If I ask for the fifth one, it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five. It's gonna give me back that 67. And say I wanted both of those for some reason, the third one and the fifth one, then I can give it a numeric vector that has both of those indices, and it'll give me back both the 75 and the 67. And we could even do logical indexing. So this is gonna give me not the first, second, but it'll give me the third, and it'll give me the fifth. So that should give me the same thing. Yeah, that's just the logical way instead of the numeric way. But I rarely access matrices this way because isn't it more convenient to think of things in the row that it's in and the column that it's in? Sure, and we can do that. Let me pick the element in the first row, second column. So that should be uh, this height, the 63. Okay, there's a way to get the 63. If I look at three, one, I'm saying go to the third row, first column. So third row is down here. First column, that should give me this 75. Okay, and that probably doesn't need much explanation because that's the natural way that we think about uh, accessing things inside a matrix. Okay, we can make this a little more complicated. What if for the row argument, the first one, I don't just say one row, but I say two rows. I want the first and the third row and the second column. And now it's a specifying kind of a submatrix. Let's check that. And again, since I've pushed my entire matrix out of the console, I'd like to be able to see it here. Okay, yeah, I'm getting stuff out of the second column, but for the first row and the third row. Now I'll try to predict before I hit control enter what line 148 is gonna do. Give me the first two rows and the first two columns, which is actually all the columns, that's gonna give me this part, right? Let's check that. Okay. It's very common that we want to extract an entire dimension. So we want either an entire row or an entire column. You can do that by leaving uh, that index blank. So this is saying, give me the third row, but if I don't specify a column, it means I want, I want all the columns. I want the entire third row. I do that and yep, sure enough, there's the entire third row. This one should give me all of the rows for the second column. I should get everything in the height column. And there's the three uh, measurements on height. All right, now here's the best one. I can use column and row names uh, with this double indexing style, which is really natural because, I mean, I don't wanna have to remember that the two always means the height variable. If I can actually refer to the height variable by name, that's much better. It's gonna make the code more readable, make it easier for me to work with or anybody else who sees it. So this is saying, let's look at just the uh, retrieval before we do the assignment. 
I'm looking in the row with the name Tanya and then the column with the name weight. And I can extract out Tanya's weight there. And uh, maybe she's been very diligent about her diet and exercise and she's actually dropped down. So let's reassign that the value 114. And let's take a look at the matrix now. Okay, yeah, right here, this, this has now changed. And then this part is actually kind of accurate. Uh, initially, this is referring to the old value of my weight, which is 157. But when the entire line is run, that will change it and update it to 167. So as a general rule for making good readable code, I would say whenever you have attribute names and it's possible to index by those, I think you should. It's uh, easier and faster to understand than using numbers. All right, any questions or comments before I go to the next section? All right, I'll keep on going. Now that we have matrices, we can talk about uh, matrix operations. And we don't need anything special for matrix addition because matrix addition and subtraction, that's done component by component, right? That's what R does by default anyway. So we don't need a special thing to say, do matrix addition. But matrix multiplication, multiplication that's very different from component-wise multiplication, right? We do need a special symbol for that. And that's by wrapping the asterisk inside the percent signs. That represents matrix multiplication rather than uh, component-wise. So let me define two matrices. And I'll notice something here. I've actually got one command that's broken up into three lines, it's kind of a long command. I could just string the thing out and it would go all the way across. But then when I make my R markdown document, that's gonna actually go off the page. Uh, it's gonna be hard to read. So you can break a command uh, up into multiple lines and that's fine. Just make sure you end the whole thing with the parentheses. And it's usually good practice to try to find a natural place to break it. So I'm intending to make a three by three matrix. So I decided to break the lines uh, inside the vector that gives me the nine entries that I wanna make the matrix out of. And I didn't have to break them up row by row, but I thought that would be natural. And it'd be easy for you to understand why you're looking at it. So that's why I, I did it this way. So let me run that. And then uh, B is gonna be a matrix that just has the numbers one through nine going by row. So let's look at each one of these. Uh, there's A and there's B. I've got two matrices. So if I wanna add them, all I have to do is just A plus B. And you can check and confirm that, yeah, it's just going component by component. Two plus one, there's the three. Negative three plus two, there's the negative one and so on. If for some reason I wanted to multiply entry by entry, I could do that. But that's not normally how uh, matrices are multiplied. So I'll use the percent signs wrapped around that. And there's the actual matrix product, A times B. Uh, remember the transpose of a matrix, which is kind of flipping the, the rows and columns or flipping it over the diagonal. That's the T function. T of A will give the transpose of A. If you need the determinant of a matrix, that's just DET. So there's determinant of A, negative 351. If you want the inverse of a matrix, use the solve function. So there is the inverse of uh, the matrix A. The solve function has a different use. If you just give it a matrix, it'll give you the inverse, supposing that it exists. Uh, you can also use solve by giving it two matrices and it'll solve this equation. So the first input times an unknown equals the second input, and then it'll solve for that unknown. So assuming that A is invertible, this would be equivalent to multiplying each side by A inverse on the left, uh, A inverse times B, but it's more efficient than actually calculating uh, the inverse. So there's the matrix such that A times that matrix would give you B. Here's a little shortcut. If you want the identity matrix of a given size, you can use the diag function. So there's the five by five identity matrix, ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Uh, but diag has a different use. 
if you give it not a number, but an already existing matrix, it will extract out the diagonal. So from A, I can see the diagonal should be two, three, negative one. And if I run that line, yeah, it'll spit that back out to me. Here's some other convenience functions. If I want row sums, that'll give me the sum of each row. If I want averages, row means will give me that. And then there's similar functions for column sums and call means. Uh, we will actually use those uh, quite a bit when we get into the statistical learning component of the class. All right, uh, it's very common that you want to not just sum or average columns, but you would want to standardize them. You would want to take each entry, subtract away the mean, divide by the standard deviation, basically finding the z-score of each entry for that variable. Uh, that's built in with the scale function. So let's take a, take a look at that. So here, this is taking the matrix A. It took the first entry, subtracted the mean of the first column, divided by standard deviation of the first column, and there's the result. So that's the z-score of the first entry with respect to the first column. And then it's done that all the way through the matrix. Now notice when it printed, it's not just giving me the scaled matrix, but it's giving me a couple of attributes. So it saved uh, the means of each one of the columns. First column had mean three, second column had mean one. There's the mean for the third column. And then the next one is the standard deviation, something measuring the scale of each of the columns. Standard deviation of columns one, two, and three. So suppose that we wanted to uh, extract those later, then I can use ATTR, the shortcut attributes. Let me pull out the scale, and then it didn't work because I never actually ran 206 into the assignment. There, if I try it, that's a way that I can get the standard deviations of the original A after the fact. That's gonna be useful, and that's gonna come into one of your, I think, uh, homework five problems. All right, any questions on the uh, matrix operations section of the notes? Okay, now I'm gonna show you something that uh, I wish somebody had shown me a long time ago. I had to learn this the hard way. I was writing some code. I think it was actually the first time that I taught this class and I'm trying to do some matrix operations. And sometimes I would get an error and sometimes I wouldn't, and I didn't know why. So I'm gonna warn you about it here. Attributes are not permanent. Uh, you should think of them as kind of temporary or ephemeral because when R extracts or changes or coerces something about an object, sometimes it'll keep the attributes and sometimes it will not. Uh, and this can be a problem when we're expecting something to have certain dimensions. But if R drops the dimensions attribute when you're not expecting it, and you're just getting back an ordinary dimensionless vector, now your matrix calculations don't work anymore and you get errors and it takes a long time to figure out why. So let's go back to a simple object with attributes, the names attribute. Let me pull out the second and third values out of the Gini vector. Okay, it pulled those out and notice the names are still there. In this case, subsetting kept the names. But now, uh, let me try to take these numbers and turn them into characters. So I'm passing this into as.character. Okay, and the numbers are here. They've been converted to characters, but where did the names go? They're gone. They were dropped in that coercion. If I now try to look at the names after it gets turned into a character, it's null, there's not any. So it did have names, but the coercion uh, dropped them. So this suggests that when you are setting up your data or cleaning your data, there's a good order of operations. You should probably change the types of any objects before you add attributes because the attributes would be dropped and you would just have to add them back on later. And once you figure out the order, uh, this usually isn't a big deal, but here's the one that really drove me nuts for a long time. I'm going to start with a matrix, matrix A, I'll have it printed in the console. And I'm gonna run the call sums function. So that's giving me the sum of each column. 
Maybe you can check one of those in your head and, and verify, sure, it's just column sums. All right, now I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm going to subset part of the matrix A. I'm gonna pick up all of the rows, but just the first two columns. So let me work with this from the inside out. We can see that's ignoring the third column. It's dropping that one, just looking at the first two. And so if I do column sums, that still works. What if I pick out just the first column of this? Well, let's look. Those are the three numbers that are in the first column, right? Two, negative one, and eight. But you see how it has them displayed out horizontally instead of vertically? Watch what happens when I try to do column sums on that. I get an error. It says that I need an array of at least two dimensions. Doesn't it seem like I should have something with dimensions? Because I took a matrix and I got a particular column out of it. Why shouldn't it be able to sum uh, the entries in that column? Does anybody see the problem yet? Can you tell what's going on? Can we add a transpose to it? Ooh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know if that'll do it or not. Let's find out. Hmm. Well, let's see what this did. Let's just look at what happens after we add the transpose. Now I can tell from this part that it has denoting the row and the part denoting the columns. It looks like this is now a matrix, but it's not the right way, right? It's now a, it's a row vector instead of the column vector like I wanted it to be. Now I'm just playing around a little bit here. I don't think this is the best way to do it. What if I added another transpose? <laughs> that actually works, but that's pretty hacky, right? It's kind of weird. Shouldn't the transpose the transpose be the original thing? It seems like it, but, uh, but actually no. Let's figure out what's going on and see if we can find a cleaner way to, to fix this. All right, so we're gonna go through this very systematically. I started with the matrix A, which is three by three, and it's a matrix. Then I looked at just the first two columns. So if I look at the first two columns, this is now three by two, and it's still a matrix. But if I only select the first column, now it says there aren't any dimensions and it's lost the matrix class. It's now just a numeric vector. It's not a matrix or an array anymore. So here's what's going on. In general, whenever you extract a part of a structured object that has dimensions, R will turn that into the simplest kind of object that still has all those core values in it. So when we were getting multiple columns of the matrices, it kept it as a matrix. But we only picked out one, R says, let's simplify it. Let's just turn this into a numeric vector and let's drop the fact that it has dimensions and it's not a matrix anymore. Uh, that is a little bit unnatural. And uh, I didn't know that R would do this uh, until I finally looked it up and, and learned. Uh, here's how you can prevent this from happening. Whenever we subset it, I'm gonna add an extra argument called drop equal to false which looks a little weird. I'm used to putting arguments in functions and this is in square brackets, this is indexing. But we're gonna find out in the, the next lecture, indexing is really just a special kind of function and it's okay to add optional arguments to it. So let's check this out. Now, if I pick the first column and I tell it, don't drop any attributes. Now see that it's printing it, not just as an ordinary uh, vector, but it looks like a column vector again. It still has its dimensions now, which is three by one. It's still a matrix, and now the column sums works on that. All right, I'll, I'll pause. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, I think one of your homework problems is gonna have you investigate a situation kind of like this. 
All right, on to the next section. So now we're gonna start moving back towards uh, statistics and, and data science. Uh, very commonly, we're gonna have data that isn't numeric, but is categorical. It classifies an observation into one of a, a small number of categories. In R, these are represented as a factor. Now a factor is not a data type. So this is something that's a higher level classification than numeric, logical, or I'm sorry, uh, integer double numeric, <laughs> integer double character logical. There, now I got the four common, common types. Uh, it's created actually out of the integer type, but then by adding an attribute called levels. If you have nominal data, which means uh, these categories don't have a natural ordering to them, and any ordering is just as valid as, as any other, that's just an ordinary factor. But if you have uh, categories that do have a natural ordering to them, and we'll see an example in just a second, uh, that's an ordered factor. So let's try constructing one. I'm gonna start with a complicated one to see all the details, and then I'll show you a simpler one after this. Making an object called ed level, education level, and I want it to be a factor. So it's wrapped inside the factor function. Now inside I'm giving a, this is actually just a named character vector. So for the name Steve, we're going to give the value of doctorate. And then for the value uh, named Tanya, we're gonna give the value of a bachelor's degree. Now, when you define a factor, there could be other possible levels that don't appear in uh, the initial vector that you're passing in. So there's more educational levels than just a doctorate and bachelor's, right? Some of you guys are going for a, a master's degree. So then I can say what the levels are. And I've classified it as there's less than high school, high school, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. And this is a case where there is a natural ordering to these. You have to progress through all of these and get one before you can get the next one. So I set ordered equal to true. So let's take a look at this. I have created that factor. Let me just have it print. All right, so here's how to read this. The first value of this factor is doctorate. And that one has the name of Steve attached to it. The second value is bachelor's with the name attribute of Tanya. Uh, and then on the bottom down here, uh, these are just the possible levels of the factor. It could be one of these things, less than high school. Now this is a little bit confusing because this less than is actually part of the factor name, but then all of these others are showing that it's ordered. So less than high school is less than high school, which is less than bachelor's and so on. If I have a factor and I want to pull out what the possible levels are, I can use the levels function. So that will print them out as just a character vector. If I want to know if this is ordered or not, I can use is.ordered. And this one is, so that comes back true. Now here's something interesting. If I check the type, doesn't a factor look like its characters? It looks like text, right? It actually isn't. Under the hood, it's actually an integer. And the reason is, if we want something to be ordered, then we need something like numbers uh, that can have that property of ordering to them. So under the hood, a factor is really an integer, but then the levels are kind of the labels that are on top of it. So it's kind of like, uh, actually less than high school would be one, high school is two, then three, four, and five. So this doctorate for Steve is really a five, but it prints it as that level uh, instead of, well, the number that it represents underneath. Does that make sense? Let's also check the attributes. Uh, a factor has names, it has levels, and this has actually two classes. It's a factor, and more than that, it's an ordered factor. I can use structure and I can see kind of the entire uh, information about this object if I like. All right, so a few notes on this. I actually talked through this part. The factors look like characters. They're actually the integer type. They just have levels uh, on top of them. The names that I added in the character vector, those are optional. 
So if I didn't put in the Steve and the Tanya, the code would still run just fine. I would just be missing a names attribute. And if all of the levels of the variable are included in the data that constructs the factor, you don't have to give it a levels argument. So now we can make a simplified example. Um, I'm taking lunch orders for some people and one of the options is what kind of fruit they want. And the only options are apple, banana, and orange. Well, I take orders from five people, apple, banana, banana, orange, apple. That includes everything, right? There's no additional levels that are omitted. Uh, and this is not ordered. It doesn't make sense to say banana less than orange. So all I have to do is just pass that character string into factor. Okay, and then here's my factor. There's the five values, apple, banana, banana, orange, apple, and then the levels that tell me everything that's possible. I can pull out the levels. Is this one ordered? No, I didn't construct it as anything ordered. And so the class for this one is just factor. It's not an ordered factor. All right, now when I was first learning R, I wondered, do we really need factors? Why can't we just use characters? Why can't we just have a text string that tells me uh, what the level is? Why do I need this new kind of data object to do it for me? Well, there's several reasons. One is that the levels attribute preserves information about what all the possibilities are, even if a particular subset of the data doesn't include all the levels. So for example, that first one we made, the education level, the data had a doctorate and a bachelor's. It didn't have any master's degree, but by having that levels attribute, we know that that's a possibility. So if we expand the data set later, there's kind of like a placeholder level for that. Also, let me do this. Let me look at fruit, but just one to three. So that picks out the apple, the banana, and the banana. There's no oranges in the first three, but the levels attribute is keeping track of that. There's still the idea that there could be an orange. Maybe there is later uh, in the data. Uh, kind of serves as a placeholder for that. Also, characters can't be ordered the way that factors can be. So if you had an ordered factor, there's really no way to keep track of that ordering with uh, characters. And then finally, if we pass data with the factor class to certain functions for modeling, like the LM for linear models, uh, then R is going to know to treat this as a categorical variable and it'll handle it the right way. All right, then just, just a comment there. All right, before I go to the next section, any questions on factors? We will be using factors quite a bit later on in the class. Okay, so now let's go to our uh, next kind of object, which is uh, potentially much more complicated than the atomic vectors that we've seen. It's called a list. Uh, lists are objects that contain any number of any kind of other R objects. So if we wanted to combine multiple vectors together, we could put those in a list. If we wanted to combine multiple matrices, and we will need to do that later in the class, we can put those inside a list. We can put functions inside a list. We can even put another list inside a list. So for some, that reason, they're sometimes called recursive vectors because a list is an object that can contain uh, other copies of the same type to them. And we can even mix them. If we need for some reason to combine a vector with a function and another list, we can do that inside a list. So these are very uh, flexible and multi-purpose kinds of R objects. All right, so I'm gonna start with an example. I'm gonna make a list called a burrito menu. So if you order a burrito, there's several things you have to decide. First, what kind of tortilla do you want? What kind of meat do you want on it? What kind of toppings? What's your drink order? And then maybe you get some upcharges. Maybe if you add some nachos or guacamole, uh, then they're gonna uh, increase the price of your order. So notice that uh, most of these are things we would think of as characters or, or possibly factors, like the kind of tortilla, either flour or corn. It's probably okay to leave that as a character. But then the upcharges, that's something numeric. So far, we haven't been able to mix these two kinds of data together but we can have them as different components inside a list. So let me run this. 
All right, I've created the list. Let's now see how it prints. So inside the burrito menu list, the first thing is a vector called tortilla. And here's what's inside tortilla, it's either flour or corn. The second thing inside the list is another character vector called meat, which has these four possibilities. The third thing inside the list is toppings. There's the fourth thing inside the list. And then there's the, the fifth one. Let me look at the structure of this. I, I really like this. This is a, a nice uh, printout to give you a lot of information about this. It's a list with five things in it. The first one is tortilla. It's a character of length two. And I can see what's inside and so on and so on. Notice down here when I get to up charges, that's not a character like the rest, that's numeric. All right, I wanted to give another example of a list. And so uh, doing a couple things differently. In this one, you see how I'm not naming the vectors that are inside? So right here, this tortilla, that's actually optional. It's helpful because it lets me give some meaning to what these are choices for. But here I'm saying my first thing inside this new list is just a vector with A, B, and C doesn't have any name to it. And then the next thing doesn't have a name either. Just to show that I can, I'm gonna mix characters, numbers, and logicals. And then I'm even gonna put another list, which I'll call the inner list, or at least it has a character vector inside called inner list. Let's take a look at how this thing prints out. So in this new list, let me, let me point something out. Uh, now before, when I gave names to the vectors inside the list, you see how it's using a dollar sign and then it's actually giving me what the names are? Right, that's gonna be important in a minute. If I don't give it any names, it gives double brackets and it says, all right, here's the first thing in the list. There's no name, so I'm just gonna say it's the first one. Here's the second thing inside the list. Here's the third one. And then because the fourth thing is a list itself, I get two sets of double brackets. The fourth thing inside my outer list is a list. And then the first thing inside that is a character that has inner and list inside it. Confused yet? Let's practice indexing and subsetting lists. We've seen some of this already. When list elements don't have names, R prints them with double brackets, two square brackets, and then it lists the vector elements with single brackets inside. So like I see the double brackets and then the single brackets. When they do have names, it prints them using the dollar sign and the name, and then it goes to the single bracket. So there's three things going on here single brackets, double brackets, and dollar signs. Let's figure out what all of these things mean. They're all ways of indexing and subsetting. Let's go through them one by one. And I think I'd actually like to be looking at the, the document for this to be a little easier to read. Here we are. The single bracket indexing, we've already used that on atomic vectors. This can potentially access multiple elements of an object. So we have to be careful using this on lists. Remember that lists can contain different types that can't be mixed and matched together. So if you use single bracketing, it has to give back another list. Otherwise you might mix things that can't be mixed. So for consistency, if, even if we're accessing just one thing using single brackets, it still has to return that as a list. Otherwise we would have a, a terrible inconsistency that would be very confusing in the language. So I think of the single brackets as only subsetting at the top level and it's only picking out one thing inside the list and it gives you back a list with that in it. Let's go to, no, let, let's wait on the examples. Let's look at the three kinds of indexing first. Double brackets. It works almost the same way as single brackets, but you can only get one element out at a time. So you can use something like this, double brackets with a three, and that's fine, but I can't do something like this. 
because this is trying to pull out two elements at once, the third one and the fifth one. Double brackets does not allow that. We'll get an error. This means if we're only pulling out one thing at a time, we don't have to worry about mixing types. So what it gives you back doesn't have to be a list with that thing inside, but it can give you the thing that was inside the list. Unless the thing that was inside the list is also a list. We well, don't worry about that case yet. So this double bracket, it can reach a little bit farther in. It can reach past the list structure and then pull out the thing that's inside the list. And then finally, the dollar sign. This is a notational shortcut for the double brackets, but using names uh, instead of just a number with the added benefit of allowing abbreviations. And it's one that we can't use on atomic vectors. Now, I'm guessing you probably need to see the examples first, but do you have any questions at this point? Okay, this is one that I had, had trouble learning, so focus as best you can. Let's see what we can get out of this. I'm going to start by making a simple named numeric atomic vector, the one that has uh, three numbers in it, and each one of those numbers has a name. So we know that we can use single brackets, and we could get out, say, the second and the third one. All right, and that works just fine. If I use double brackets, this is only going to be able to get access to one thing at a time. So that can give me back the second number in that vector. And notice it dropped the attribute when I did that. I'm just kind of curious. Will drop equal to false work on double brackets? Hmm, it ran, but it still dropped it anyway. So that, that must not work on that one. If I try to get two things out with double brackets, it's not going to allow that. I get an error. Attempt to select more than one element in vector index. Double brackets only lets you get out one thing at a time. There's the dollar sign, which can access things by name, but only on lists. And I don't have a list right now. I've got an atomic vector. So if I do that, it doesn't work. And it tells me the dollar sign operator is invalid for atomic vectors. OK. So now let me go to my burrito menu, which is a list. Let me pull out the fourth and the fifth things. So actually, first, let me print out the whole burrito menu. Just so I can remind myself that uh, the drink and the upcharges vectors, those are the two that are in the fourth and fifth positions. If I use single brackets and pull out four and five, it gives me both of those, exactly like I would expect. And notice, this is another list right now, right? It has to be. Otherwise, I couldn't mix characters and numbers. What if I use single brackets and I just pull out the fourth one? It had to give me a list before, so it has to give me a list this time too. So this is not just a character vector, but it's a list that has a character vector inside of it. Notice if I check the type of this, it's still saying the type is a list, not that it's a character vector. So you see how the, the single brackets can only reach in a little ways? It can get another list that has that thing, but it can't get the thing on the inside out. If I use my double brackets, notice this one looks a little bit different. It doesn't have that dollar sign in the drink. It just has those three characters. It looks like this has reached farther in and pulled out the character vector. Let me check the type of that. Yeah, now the list structure is gone and I just have the character vector that was inside of it. Now there I was accessing it by number. I can also access it by name if I like. And that does the same thing as double brackets with the four. Okay, are you starting to see the difference between the single brackets and double brackets when you use them on a list? I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna draw a picture now for a moment. One way to think about a list 
it's kind of like a locomotive that has an engine that's pulling a lot of things behind it. So let me think about my burrito menu. It's a list and I'm going to think of this or conceptualize it as Actually, about 20 minutes before class, I did Google how to draw a train. So I hope that paid off. All right, here's my locomotive, chugga, chugga, chugga. And I've got it pulling some cargo wagons. Now, one thing that's inside the burrito menu is the drink. So there's, there's one wagon that it's pulling. And let's see, I'll make two more. All right, so I can think about each one of these as the vectors that are inside the list. And then the fact that they're being pulled by the locomotive, that's kind of like having it all encapsulated inside a list structure. If I access something with single brackets, Oh, let's see, I kind of changed the order of things. That's fine. I'll just adjust it how they are here. So don't have this follow the notes as closely as it's following my picture right here. If I pulled out the first thing with single brackets, which is equivalent to pulling out the drink named vector, what that does, it doesn't just give me the vector that has drink, but it's still wrapped inside another list, which is kind of like this thing being pulled by a locomotive. But when I go to double bracket indexing, And it doesn't matter if that's numeric or named. Those are interchangeable. As long as I have the double brackets, it's dropping the locomotive. It's dropping the list structure. And I'm just getting back the vector that has the drinks in it. It's like getting just that cargo wagon away from the train. Does that help or does that make it more confusing? Guess I'll find out when I grade the homework. Okay, going back uh, to the code, uh, let me look at the dollar sign again. The dollar sign is just a shortcut for accessing by names with the uh, similar as how you would for double brackets. Um, it just doesn't require quotes and it's, it's kind of fast. This is very common in practice. So if I want to pull out the drink vector inside burrito menu, I can do burrito menu dollar sign drink. And there's that character vector inside, water, soda, tea. One cool thing about this is if you have non-ambiguous abbreviations, it'll figure out what you mean and it'll, it'll give that to you. So nothing else has a name that starts with a D. So I can just do burrito menu uh, D and I can get back the same thing. But if it's ambiguous, what if I just do T-O well, that could be either where's my could be either tortilla or it could be toppings. That's ambiguous. So if I try to run that line, it comes back as null because it doesn't know what I'm actually referring to. But just one more letter will let it be non-ambiguous. There's the tortilla options. There are the topping options. All right. Uh, it's common and useful to mix these different kinds of indexing methods together. So let's say that I want the first kind of tortilla for my burrito. Well, I can start with the burrito menu list. 
I can use dollar sign to look at the tortilla options. And then if I want the first one, which is flour, I can use either single or double brackets to access that one. And so that's a way that I can reach into the list, into the vector and pull out the entry inside. All right, uh, I, will, I will keep on going. Stop me if you do have questions. So now we've arrived at the next section and kind of what I consider the most central data structure in R. It's not the simplest one, it's not the most complicated, but I do feel like it's the one at the middle. That's uh, kind of the, the best starting spot. So for this class, which I'm teaching to grad students as well as upper level undergrads, and I'm expecting a deep level of understanding from you guys, I started from the ground and it tried to build up to data frames. But I'm also designing uh, a 1000 freshman level course in data science. And for them, we're starting with data frames because that's kind of the central, most fundamental uh, data type. A data frame is actually a special kind of a list. A data frame is a list where every element is a vector that has the same length. So that means the data can be arranged in a rectangular format. Every list element is a column and it usually represents a variable. Every row is gonna contain precisely one element from each list. And that's usually gonna represent data collected from the same individual. This gives us the classic way of representing data with the variables and columns and then the individuals going by row by row. Data frames have the best properties of both matrices and lists. So as with a matrix, uh, a data frame has rows and columns. So we can use a double index square brackets with a, a row and a column. An ordinary list doesn't have dimensions and you can't do that with an ordinary list. One good thing about list is that we can include objects of different types like the numerics, the character, and actually I should change that. A factor is a different class, not a different type. I'll update that for the next time I teach this. But a matrix is atomic. A matrix either has to be entirely numeric or entirely character or entirely integer, and it can't mix those. One good thing about a list is that you can select an entire column or variable quickly with a dollar sign notation. A matrix is atomic and can't do that. But a data frame can do all three of these things. Double index square brackets, including objects of different types, and dollar sign notation. It's the best of all worlds. All right, if you want to construct a data frame, if you're doing it from scratch, there's a data.frame function. If you already have something like a matrix and you wanna turn that into a data frame, then there is an as.dataframe function, which will try and coerce an already existing object into a data frame. All right, let's go to the code and let's, let's construct one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start by constructing the individual columns, each one representing a different variable. And then I'm gonna combine those all together into the data frame. So first I'll make a name variable with values, Steve, Tanya, Kara. I'll make a weight column, a height column, and an education column so that I'm mixing uh, characters, numerics, and factors. And I'll even put in a second factor, uh, blood type. All right, because these are the three people in the Cardin family, I'll call this object Cardin's, and it's data.frame, and then just see how I'm including each of the variables represented by its own, uh, own vector, all combined together with data frame. So let me inspect that object. Now I like this. Uh, if you have a data frame, it doesn't print like an ordinary list would, even though this is a special case of a list, but it's giving me well, rows and columns, like a matrix would. And I think that's a more uh, natural way to look at these. Now notice something else. This is already uh, automatically used the variable names to make the column names. So this very first uh, column, that came from a vector called name, and it gave that name to it. The second one came from a vector called weight, and it's given that name to it. So let's look at the structure of a data frame a little bit. If I check the type, I see it's a list. A data frame is just a special kind of list. If I check class, 
I now see it's a little more than just a list, but it's a data frame object. I can look at attributes and a data frame has, well, there's the variable names, the column names. It's got a class and I didn't actually give it any row names. So it just gives it one, two, and three by default. I can extract out the column names and I could also use that function to set them if I wanted to change one. And names will do the same thing. The row names, yeah, that was just one, two, three. And then if I look at STR, that's the structure. So this looks a lot like the structure for a list, which makes sense because it is. Here are the different entries inside the list, and I can get more information about their type, character, number, number, ordered factor, and then a non-ordered factor. Now, one thing that surprised me when I started investigating this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna shut this door. Oh, you're getting a little loud in the hallway. I was expecting to see a dimensions attribute because if a data frame is uh, arrayed out rectangularly, it seems like it has rows and columns, but it doesn't actually keep an explicit uh, dimensions attribute. Instead, what it does, it looks to see how long row names is and how long column names is, and then it figures out from that uh, how many dimensions it has. But I can run dim on it and that still will return. This has three rows and five columns. If I just wanna know how many rows or columns individually, there's in row and in call. And those are very useful uh, functions, especially in row, because when we start doing statistical learning, we'll need to know what our sample size is, which means we wanna know how many observations there are, how many rows are in the data frame, and that's the fastest and usually the best way to find that out. All right, this next page, this is a little bit heavy. So I know we're over an hour in, hopefully you haven't lost focus yet. Fundamentally, the Cardin's object is a list, which means if I use single bracket indexing with just one index, it's gonna treat it like a list and it's gonna come back with the second variable that we put in. Now, if I remember the second variable is weight. So if I do that, Ah, it's extracting back that weight column. And if I check the class of that, it's still a data frame. I could, if I want, select the third and the fourth column simultaneously, and I get those two columns, and that's still a data frame as well. So a single index will give you uh, a column. If I do double indices, it's gonna give me back one entry in the corresponding row and column. So let's check that. That's giving me back the uh, height for the second person. And notice, since that's a very, it's just one entry, it's kind of a simple object, then it's stripping away any attributes or class. It's not a data frame anymore. It's just an entry that was in the data frame. This is just a, a double, just a numeric thing. Here, I'm saying take all the rows in the third column. Now notice, this is dropping structure. It's dropping the name. It's dropping the fact that it was arrayed vertically. That's just giving me back uh, those three things in a, in a double vector. So kind of the point of that is, if we're selecting something very simple and everything that we're selecting is of the same type, R is going to simplify the kind of object that it is. But what if I pick multiple columns? So consider this. What if I tried to pick something out of the third column and the fourth column simultaneously? These are not the same type, right? Over here, I got a number. Over here, I've got a level for a factor. So it can't simplify that because it would turn it into an atomic vector and that can't mix types. This is going to have to preserve the data stream, data frame structure. So let me pull out second and third row, second and third column. All right, I can look at that and I can see it looks like it's still keeping this in the data frame kind of format. I check the type and the class. It's still a list and it's still a data frame. So again, we're kind of getting back to that concept of 
If it can simplify things, it will. If it can't, it doesn't. If I go to double brackets on a data frame, then it'll treat this like it does a list. This will pick out the second thing in the list, which will be the, that's the weight column. But notice it has dropped the list or data frame structure because it's reaching farther in. It's going past the data frame structure, pulling out just that vector. I can check the type of that. It's just double and it's numeric, no list, no data frame. Dollar sign access, remember that's just a notational shortcut for double brackets. So it's gonna do the same thing. If I refer to the weight variable, it drops the data frame and list structure. It just gives me back a vector with the weight values inside. It's a double and it's numeric. All right, and like before, I can combine my different indexing methods together. I'll take the Cardin's data frame, look at the weight variable, pull out the first entry of that, and that's 157. I'll look at the Cardin's, I'll look at the blood type variable, I'll look at the third entry in that, and that's a missing one because I don't actually know what my daughter's blood type is. All right, that part's a little bit heavy. Let me pause. Do you have any comments or questions? All right, it's common that we need to add on to an already existing data frame. And there's a few ways of doing this. I'll show you R bind stands for row bind that can add new rows or observations onto the end kind of row by row. Uh, C bind that's column bind. That can be used to add new things uh, as you move across horizontally. Um, that can be used to add new columns or variables. These both work for matrices as well. And I actually forgot to put in one method uh, with uh, adding something by dollar sign notation. And I'll show an example of that too on the fly. All right, so first I'm going to make a, uh, another data frame a small one, just two observations, but it's gonna have the same variable names as the first one that I've made. So let's remember in Cardin's, I've got name, weight, height, education, and blood type. So I decided I would put the two pets that we have in the house. We've got a, a Chihuahua mix named Fiona, and we've got a bearded dragon named Phoenix. So I'm making sure that I have name, weight, height, education, blood type. Otherwise my data frames would not be compatible and I couldn't combine them. Okay, maybe I'll print that one out in the console so I can see it. Similar structure. I can use rbind for cardons and pets. And notice that after it combines them, I'm gonna overwrite the additional cardons. So it won't exist anymore with just the human, but it'll have everything inside. All right, there we go. I've got uh, an expanded data frame with two additional rows now. Okay, so I decided I would add another factor since I don't only have humans now uh, that I would include a species. And I decided uh, this should probably be a factor. So it starts off with three humans. So I'll have it repeat human three times and then a dog and then a bearded dragon. So maybe I'll, I'll print that so I can see it. Okay, so there's my new variable that's ready to be put into the data frame. And I could do it this way. But I decided, let me add in another way of doing it. As of right now, I don't have a variable in Cardin's called species. If I try to refer to it, it's null. But that's fine. I can assign that to the species object that I just created. And now let me check that out. Okay, and there we go. It's added it on to the end. So if I'm just adding one variable in at a time, which is pretty common, um, I like using the dollar sign notation for that. Any questions there? All right, we're nearly done. Last section. We already used a little bit of logical subsetting uh, previously in, in the last lecture. And there we were doing logical subsetting based on conditions that that vector satisfied. 
Now that we've got data frames and lists, especially data frames, I might want to take a subset of one variable based off of a condition in another one. Like for example, what if I wanted the average weight of the humans in the data set? And I'd like to average weight values, but only if they satisfy the human condition uh, and, and not the dog or the bearded dragon. So let's, um, let's practice doing that. And here I'm gonna use a different data set. This is one that's built into R. It's famous, it's called Iris. And we're gonna use it a lot when we get to the classification part of the course. Contains measurements on 150 iris flowers with four numeric variables representing measurements on their plant parts. And then one factor representing the species. So first, uh, if I just have it printed to the console, you know, it's pretty big because it's 150 different uh, observations. So here's a trick. If you just want to get a sense for what a data frame looks like without having it overwhelm your console, uh, the head function, that will only show you the first six rows. So let's take a look at this. I've got my four numeric measurements on sepals and petals, their lengths and widths, and then the species, which is a, a factor over here. This one's built into R and it has its own uh, help function or documentation page. So you can do question mark iris. And then if you want to, you could read a little bit about this and uh, you know, learn about where it's origin and stuff. Uh, I'll also have it print out the structure so we can see it. A kind of similar output as the head, but now it's uh, arrayed more horizontally than vertically. And uh, here, here's a nice thing. If I use the summary function, this will give me the five number summary along with the mean for each of the numeric variables. And it'll also give me a frequency table for the factor variables. So I can tell the species are split up, split up evenly. There's 50 each. And then I can get a sense of the range and the center of each of the numeric measurements. Okay, so here's the problem. We are going to try to find the average petal width for the versicolor species. So I wanna average some of these flowers, but not all of them, just the versicolor. So I'm gonna kind of start from the inside and build this one up piece by piece. I only wanna get the versicolor species. So let me do this. Let me first use the dollar sign indexing so I can refer to the species column or variable. Okay, and there I can see it. It's 50 of each, like we already knew. I only want the versicolor ones. Let me do the double equal to versicolor. And this is gonna give back a logical vector that tells me where the versicolor are. It happens to be the 50 that are in the middle from uh, 51 to 100. I'm gonna use this logical vector and I'm gonna put that inside single brackets and that's gonna index the rows of iris. So notice I'm taking the highlighted part and I'm just moving that right here. But now that's a row index on iris and I'm saying, give me all the columns. So the column is blank. I want the entire collection of variables, but only the rows for versicolor. So let me try running that. All right, so this is nice. Notice my row names now go from 51 to 100. So it's that middle third of the data set. And I have all of the variables, but it's only for the versicolor species. Okay, so we've kind of restricted attention to the flowers that we want to know about. And what we wanna know is the average petal width. So let me take that line. And on the end of that, I'm gonna put the dollar sign and I'm going to extract out the uh, the petal width. So if I do that, line 518 is giving me the width of all of those, of uh, the petals of all the versicolor species. And then finally, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna wrap it inside the mean function so that it calculates the average. And there we go. If it's a versicolor flower, uh, its petal width on average is about 1.326. Okay, you follow all that? It's gonna be a good thing to work through on your own time. Just you know, run each line, make sure you understand what it's giving and then how to plug that into the next step along.
Here's a second example, a bit similar, a little bit different. Let's make a subset of the data frame containing only the flowers with a sepal length greater than 5.8. So we're kind of looking only at the, the large flowers with respect to this measurement. And then find what proportion of that restricted data set is of the Virginica species. So this is kind of asking the question, if a flower is large, what's the probability that it's from the Virginica species? All right, so I'm going to be restricting based off of sepal length. So let me start with that. Iris dollar sign sepal length pulls just the sepal length out. And right now it's for all 150 flowers. Let me do a relational operator, comparison 5.8. Okay, so this one's not as tidy as the last logical vector is. There's lots of falses at the beginning. Uh, and then the trues and the falses are kind of mixed in together throughout the rest of it. So that's telling me in what rows I have large flowers. Well, I would like to extract those out of the data frame. So I put that as the row index, leave my column index blank so that I get back all the columns. Okay, so now I can see my restricted data set. These are only ones that have a sequel link that's bigger than 5.8. And I'm kind of curious, I look at the species and it looks like that roughly half and half, maybe a little bit more Virginica than Versicolor. And it looks like one of the species has been totally eliminated. Well, let's take that and append the dollar sign species onto it. So now I'm extracting out, these are the species for the large flowers, ones with large sepal lengths. All right, now I was curious how many of these are Virginica. So let me do this. Let me take that, set it equal or, or see where it is equal. I'm not setting, but I'm checking. Where is that equal to Virginica? Uh, wherever I see those trues, then the others were one of the other species. All right, so I'm gonna now do kind of two steps at once. Uh, I wanna know how many of these are true. One thing I could do is I could sum this. And remember, all the trues turn into ones, zero, falses turn into zeros. So the numerator of this calculation is saying there's 44 trues in there. 44 of these large flowers are uh, Virginica. In the denominator, you can see that I'm dividing. It's a really long calculation, had to be split onto two lines. I'm taking the length of that. So I'm kind of finding out well, just how many flowers are there that had a sepal length greater than 5.8? And there's 70 of them. So when I run the entire line, two lines really, it does 44 over 70, and I find out around 63% of the large flowers are from the Virginica species. Now, another way I could have done that, calculating a proportion, that's the same as averaging things when they're made up of zeros and ones already, right? I could have just calculated the mean of that logical. Whoops, didn't mean to select that. And I'd get the same answer that way. All right, you still awake? Is this making sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is something that definitely gets easier with time. It's definitely daunting the first time, but practice it. Start with uh, the small statements and build them up slowly. That's usually how I do it when I have to do something complex. And I'll point out that later in the class, we'll learn some other ways of approaching this, like with a pipe operator. And, you know, when I turn this into a dedicated R class, we will also look at how to do it with the dplyr package. Uh, but unfortunately, I think in 5660, we won't have time to get to that. We'll need to do the statistical learning at the end instead. Okay, uh, let's, let me give you just an overview of the homework problems that are going to arise out of this one. So number one is kind of open-ended. You saw how I created my own data frame that described some uh, characteristics of my, my family and the, and the pets that we own. I'd like you to do something similar, and I'm not going to tell you what topic it's on, 
You can do it based off your music preferences, maybe your family members. If you have a Hot Wheels car collection, you can do that. Just whatever you're interested in, make it fun. Uh, make sure there's at least four observations, so four rows, and then at least three variables, three columns. Um, make, the, make sure there's at least one variable that's numeric and at least one that's a factor. So you get experience with the different uh, kinds of variables. And your first column should be something usable as a unique identifier. Kind of like in mine, I had the names of people and those were unique. I'd like you to use logical indexing on the identifier column to select a row, use a column variable name to select a column, and then use these to update one of the values in the data frame. And I'll actually give you a little example of that now. I still have cardins in memory, right? Let's suppose that uh, the dog has to go on a diet. So I'm gonna try to access the row that has the dog in here. And I'll start kind of from the inside out, like, I, like I've suggested you do. So if I'm going to select based off of the dog's name, let me do this. I'll start even simpler. I use the dollar sign to select the names variable, names column. Now, which one of these is the dog? The dog's name is Fiona. It's the fourth one and I see the, uh, the true that's there. Okay, so I want to use this to select a row. So I'm gonna wrap this inside the name of the data frame and then I'm getting ready to do the double uh, index selecting. But then for the second one, I specifically want to uh, look at the weight. Now the weight is a second column and I could put a two, but I think it's more meaningful if I refer to it by name. So that should let me access the dog's weight, which is 15 pounds. And now that I've done that, I can write, overwrite it. I can reassign the value of, maybe the dog went from 15 pounds to 14 pounds. All right, so there you go. I pretty much did one B for you. Just watch the video again when you do the homework and uh, put in the specifics for your data frame instead of mine. <coughs> and then use rbind to add a new observation. And then for this part, I'll say you can either use cbind or you can use the dollar sign uh, notation to create a new variable. Uh, either one of those will get credit for this. Second problem, this code is gonna generate a small random matrix. I want you to write code that will identify and remove the row that has the smallest sum of absolute values. Sounds tricky, but start simple and kind of build it up bit by bit. All right, now for this semester in homework two, I accidentally gave you a problem that uh, would have been hard for you to do with those um, skills that you had. Identify and display the most frequent entry in the vector X. If there are ties and returning just one of those values is sufficient. The missing piece of the puzzle was the names function. A lot of you were getting really close and you were using the table function, but it was giving you back the frequencies. What you really wanted to know was what object had that frequency. Well, let's try the table function. Um, let's see, I'll just generate a random Okay, so just a, a random vector X that I've created. So a lot of you were taking this and you were either sorting or ordering. And so you were finding out which one was the most frequent like the three, but the problem was when you tried to index, it was just telling you what the three is. But if you do names on that table, now it's not giving you the values that are in the table, but it's giving you the names that are above it. So if you can find the index where the biggest one is and then get that out of the names of that, now you know which one was the most frequent. So there, there's a big clue. That's not the entire answer, but if you can use that as a component of your answer, uh, just fill in the rest of the details.
Okay, number four is a little bit of a, a mystery. If you run this line several times, sometimes it'll work, it'll return a value, sometimes it'll give null. I want you to figure out why it's sometimes given null. And then without changing the randomization part, I want you to find a way to ensure that it doesn't return null. And I'll give you a hint. This is related to the dropping of attributes, uh, like the one of the problems I showed you in the lecture. All right, and then finally for the grad students, uh, this will generate a random vector. I want you to write a line of code that will remove any values from that that are not repeated. So if it only shows up one time, it should get rid of it. If it shows up more than once, it should retain it. And as a hint, these are the uh, functions that went into my solution. All right, 